It's uh, a real pleasure to be here with you today. Actually, <laughs> at my age, it's a pleasure to be anywhere. You know that human connection is the key to improving the human condition. Human connection is the key to improving the human condition. And today we are talking about community. Community. And what is community if it's not human connection? That is the essence of who we are as a human species. It is our ability to reach out and touch each other. It is our ability to reach out and be with each other. It's our ability to reach out to others when we need them that defines who we are. It is the essence of our humanity and it is the essence of our community. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how mental health and community intersect. You see, the foundation for good mental health is community. We know from study after study after study that if we really want to have good health, and you can't have health without mental health, if you really want to have good health, the success for having good health is having excellent interpersonal, close relationships. It is that being with others. Above all the other social determinants of health, that is the key. And if you really want to have good mental health, what do you need to do? You need to reach out to others when you are having difficulty. And you need to reach out to others. It's reaching out to others which defines you and actually promotes your health. So that's what communities are about. Communities are about reaching out and letting yourself be reached by others. Now, when we talk about mental health, we, we often think we have a huge problem and a huge crisis in mental health. We actually don't have a crisis in mental health. Here's some Canadian data. And if you look at it, you actually see that most young people in, in this country are actually doing relatively well. So that our problem isn't mental health. We need to have healthy communities, which means that we need to address all sorts of different health concerns for people. We need to have communities help us be well, but, and this is an important but, we need to have communities help heal us when we're sick. And there is no dichotomy between being well and being sick. You can be sick and be well at the same time. Wow, what an interesting concept, eh? Really, you can. You can have diabetes and be very physically active and physically healthy and, and have a family and do all those good things with your life. You can do that. You can have depression and be making a major contribution to your community and your society. You can do that. They're not dichotomous constructs. But when we look at our communities, the problem isn't in mental health. The problem for our young people is mental illness. That's not, that's the problem. This is global data from the World Health Organization and you see over here in this pie chart something called a neuropsychiatric disorder. Boy, it's a big term. Basically it means having a healthy brain. Because that's what mental health is, it's having a healthy brain. And you see here that if you look globally, 
over all the diseases that we have in this entire world, that it is the mental disorders which have the largest burden of illness. And when we are not well, it's hard to be healthy. So we have to focus our community well-being and our community health not on just focusing on being healthy, but on helping us when we're not healthy. And the mental disorders, which create the largest single burden of disease in this country, in this province, and in this city, and in this room, in this room, are the disorders are the chronic illnesses of the young. They're the chronic diseases of being young. There's more data from the World Health Organization. That big orange blob that you see there is the burden within that neuropsychiatric conditions that we just looked at. And you see there that it consumes the greatest part of the brain diseases. That's the mental illnesses. And when you look at them, you see that they take off around puberty and look how much they impact in our society. 70% of all mental disorders can be diagnosed before age 25. And as I said, these are the chronic diseases of young. And when you have a mental illness when you are young, you carry that with you through your life. It's a no-brainer then to say, my goodness, what we need to do is focus on young people. We're not very good at preventing these. You know, so let's, let's not go down that path yet. We need to become better at it, but we're not good at it. But boy, you know what? We're good at identifying, and we actually now have some treatments that work. So our challenge is to help identify and self-identify young people who are falling into this chronic disease pathway when they're very young, who are going to carry this with them. Having a mental disorder when you're young not only increases the risk for poor economic outcomes, poor social outcomes, but increases the risk for diabetes, for heart disease, for stroke, for cancer for early death from all causes. And so a dollar invested young pays a huge population dividend over time. This is some Canadian data showing that in the last number of years, more and more of our young people are actually seeking help. That's a good thing. But you know what? Look where they're seeking help at. The emergency room. If you want to pick the place in our healthcare system, which is probably the most unwelcoming for someone who has a mental disorder, you would pick the emergency room. <laughs> I wish that wasn't true. The other thing is if you're going to pick a part of our healthcare system, which is about as expensive as you can get, you would pick the emergency room. If you want to pick a place in the healthcare system where you don't want to enter the system, that's called the emergency room. This is bad. <laughs> bad, bad. So what we have to do is to change this pattern. It's really good now we're becoming much more accustomed to early identification. We have to focus on the front end, not the back end. I have a, a brother. I have two, actually. One of them is a gastroenterologist. He works at the back end. <laughs> I work at the front end. You know, in the mental disorders, it's the only part in all of medicine where we wait until you're really, really, really sick before we offer you treatment. So here are some words that we need to address to make sure we're on the same page. I took all these words and phrases out of Department of Health documents related to mental health. One of my favorite is someone who has a mental wellness illness. I don't know what genius bureaucrat wrote that. 
a mental health issue. You know, a two-year-old having a temper tantrum in a grocery store is having a mental health issue, and so are his parents. But a 17-year-old boy who's psychotic is having a mental health issue, and unless we are clear in our language, we have no idea what we are talking about. You know what these words are? These are stigma. These are the stigma against people who have a mental illness. You can't have a mental illness, you have to have a mental wholeness, as opposed to mental halfness, I guess. You can't have a mental illness, you have to have a mental wellness illness. Nobody says, I have a breast lump issue. If you can't name it, you can't deal with it. So the first thing we have to do is we have to separate this mental health and mental illness piece. And when we're talking about mental health, let's talk about mental health. When we're talking about mental illness, let's talk about mental illness. We don't have a mental health crisis. We have a huge problem in providing equitable access to effective care for people who have mental illnesses. That's our challenge. So let's use the language properly. Everybody in this room, everybody in this province will have mental distress over a 24-hour period. That's normal, ubiquitous, it's good for you, suck it up. All of us will have a mental health problem at some time in our lives. Somebody dies, we lose our job. But if I lose my job, I don't need Prozac. <laughs> I need his job. So medicalizing life isn't good for us. Some people will have a mental illness, and you can have all of those things at the same time. So in addressing these community-based mental health needs for young people, we have to realize that we can't separate health and education. Children, youth, spend most of their times in schools. Surprise! <laughs> and schools are actually really important for all sorts of reasons. It's, they're crucibles of social development. They're places where you're supposed to learn the skills to be successful in our society, not just only in literacy and numeracy skills, but in all those developmental skills which are also fundamentally important. And although the systems are separate and they're silos, they must be seamlessly linked. They must be brought together because if schools are where the kids are, doesn't it make sense that schools are where we have to reach the kids? Here's a schemata of a horizontally integrated pathway to youth mental health care. Clearly, it starts with a family. Clearly, it needs primary health care. But it also clearly needs the school. The school is the place where a young person can become mentally health literate. They can understand how to obtain and maintain good mental health. They can understand mental disorders and their treatments. They can decrease stigma, and they can improve their help seeking. And it also, interestingly enough, is a place where teachers <laughs> can become mentally health literate. And we have been studying this area for quite some time, and we have amazing data to show that simple, simple, inexpensive interventions work beautifully in the school system. <coughs> CAP, you see that CAP thing? It's called Community Access Point. What could be better than a place in a school <laughs> to get health care for kids. We call them youth health centers. Wouldn't it be nice if we have them in this province? Oh, we have them in this province. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice if they actually met the health care needs of all the kids? This would be health for all just down the hall. And if you live in a rural community or in, a, in, a, in an underserviced, impoverished part of the urban community, that's a wonderful place to access that care. So we have to create models that link the schools and the health system together. We have to create models that meet the needs of young people. Schools have to be healthy places. They have to promote health and well-being. Not just mental health, but all of health. What's good for your bicep is actually good for your brain, and vice versa. They have to be places where we have 
exercise, where we have music, where we teach kids cursive writing, because all those three things actually are fundamental for neural development. They are fundamental for creativity. The most recent research I read two days ago showed that those kids who have the most aerobic exercise have the best language outcomes in schools. So we can do that, but we can also create schools that are part of this pathway, this, this seamless pathway so that kids who need care, kids who need help, can be identified, can be supported, and can be promoted to achieve the help that they actually need. You know, this is not a tall order. Having this conversation is only the beginning of the journey. Talking is good, but we need to talk smart. We need to look, where is the low-hanging fruit? How can we pick that fruit? How can we actually move ahead? How can we act? We need to find answers to things we don't know, but there is an awful lot that we do know. So we need to act. And when's the time to act? Is it tomorrow? Is it next week? No. It's now. Thank you very much.